Welcome. Well, thank you for joining us again for our Revelation Bible study on this Wednesday evening. Can you actually believe that we have been journeying through the book of Revelation together for 21 weeks now? Actually, it's over that because a couple chapters I took more than a week to go through. And uh, you've been with us during this period of time. I was just calculating it here as I was sitting praying before the meeting, and I'm confident we've had between 200 and 300,000 views of these programs from the time we've started. It's just amazing today to me how people are so interested in prophecy and the book of Revelation. Thank you also for your questions that you are raising. We'll look at some of those questions, but before we do, let's have prayer together. Father in heaven, open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word. Enable us to hear your voice speaking to us through the book of Revelation. Encourage our hearts as we study together and fill us with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've had emailed me on my cell phone the questions that you have asked. Here's a question from Jeremy. He says, is there any way you could ask Pastor Finley about what goes into the last two blanks at the bottom of the chart? I was amazed that Jeremy took the time to listen to the presentation on the seven last plagues twice, and he uh, made a chart of the seven last plagues. Now, you remember when we were looking at the plagues, we pointed out that the plagues were literal events, that they are not simply symbolic events, but they're literal happenings, but that there's a deeper spiritual meaning for each of the plagues. In the first plague, when the sore afflicts the body, the beast power said that if you do not receive the mark of the beast, you will, have a, you will not be able to buy or sell. In the first plague with the sore, God reveals that all physical security is in Christ. We can trust Christ for our physical security. In the second plague, the river and waters turn to blood. That's a actual, uh, the sea turns to blood rather. That's an actual, literal event. But if every, if the sea turns to blood, every living thing in the sea would die. It would affect the economic powers of the earth. And the beast power said, Unless you take the mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell. The second plague says all economic security is in Christ. The third plague of the rivers and waters turned to blood. The Bible says because they have slain the saints and martyrs, the people of God, so God gave them blood to drink. The third plague says all of our life is hid with God in Christ. The fourth plague with the Sun scorching men, they have accepted sun day, a day of worship. And the fourth plague says all true worship is in Christ. The fifth plague, darkness on the seat of the beast, all true light and truth comes through Christ. Now the sixth and seventh plagues can be put together. The it they lead up to the second coming of Christ. So the drying up of the river Euphrates symbolizes the drying up of the support for spiritual Babylon. And uh, it really says to us that true deliverance is in Christ. It's not in the powers of this earth to set up an earthly kingdom. In the seventh plague, and that's what you're interested in, Jeremy, in your chart, and thank you for making this chart. It's a very, very nice chart. Um, what is man's message? Man's message in the seventh plague is that unity will come through the beast power. What is God's message? That unity only comes through Christ, that there is triumph in Christ. Let's just look at that last plague. If you look at it in Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. This is one of four instances in the Bible that says it is done. It is done at creation. At the end of the six-day week, the seventh day, it is done. It is done when Christ died on the cross. He said it is finished. It is done. He didn't say I am done. He said it is done. The plan of salvation is consummated. 
men can find mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And then uh, here at the end of the seventh plague, probation has now ended at the end of the first plague. Now the wicked have revealed their true characters, and the Bible says again, it is done. Everything that God needed revealed in the plan of salvation is over completed at the end of the seventh plague. And then of course, uh, when Jesus comes and the Holy city descends, it will study a little later tonight. He says it is done. So what is man's message here? Man's message is that through the union of church and state nations can be unified. But here, When the hailstones fall from heaven, the Bible, the message of Christ is that uh, only through the victory of Jesus on the cross and the victory of Christ in the final days will man be unified. So on one hand, man wants to establish an earthly kingdom. On the other hand, God desires to establish a heavenly kingdom. On one hand, we have man using power and coercion. On the other hand, we have Christ revealing in love. The one hand, you have man's message is unity is through the beast power. On the other, it is triumph and victory in Jesus Christ. The hailstones fall to destroy the wicked. So it's triumph, victory in Christ. But thank you, Jeremy, for asking. Question two. Hello, Pastor Mark. This is Andre from South Africa. Hi, Andre. Glad you've uh, written in a question. Can you please, please give us more detail on the beast as in Daniel? We clearly can understand beast terminology. We can do on Revelation 13, but when we come to Revelation 17, there is some confusion. And you're asking, uh, Andre, about Revelation 17, 12 to 18. So let's just look at that and walk through it. Revelation 17, 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which receive no kingdom as yet. Now remember, in Revelation chapter um, 17, you have a woman representing the church riding on the scarlet colored beast representing the state powers. Church and state are fully united in an apostate religious system under the auspices of the papacy. The ten horns are ten kings or kingdoms that were not yet present in John's day, but they represent this conglomeration of kingdoms that will turn upon the woman and the beast, as we will see. It says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom, yes, yet, but they receive authority one hour as kings with the beast. So for a short period of time, These ten horns, or the ten kingdoms, unite with the beast. What do they do? These these are of one mind, and they'll give their power and authority to the beast. They'll make war with the lamb. The lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Isn't that amazing? You have these great conglomerate, this great power unites together with the beast power. And they make war with the lamb, Jesus, but Jesus overcomes them. Now, then he said to me, the waters that you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, burn her up. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. The beast power says, this woman riding on the scarlet colored beast, the union of church and state, the whole idea here, Andre, was that through the union of church and state, peace would come to the earth. Therefore, buying into that deception, because Christ is the only prince of peace, buying into that deception, the nations of the world unite with this church-state conglomeration union. But that union doesn't deliver what it says it could deliver. There is no peace. There's chaos and confusion. So as a result of that, the 10 kingdoms representing these powers of earth turn upon this woman and the scarlet colored beast. They turn upon it and there's destruction. So because the beast power could not deliver, she finds her support 
drying up and the powers of earth that have united with her previously warring against her. Uh, the third question is very similar to this one. Um, the third question says um, about the woman in the church makes it difficult to understand how can the Pope destroy his own church as Revelation 17 verses 12, 13, 15, 16, 17 is destroyed by the beast which receives it power from the ten kings. Is the harlot the same woman in verse 18? When the Bible talks about the harlot woman and the beast, it's talking about one power that unites. That which battles against her are the ten horns that once gave their allegiance to this beast. So there's really no contradiction there at all. Um, question four. I'm Pippin from Kenya. Hi, Kenya. I'm going to be going to Kenya, the Lord willing, in September to hold a large evangelistic meeting all across Africa. We'll broadcast it. My question is, in Revelation 18, 1, is it a prophetic one day, the, one, the year day principle? Please expound on this. This is where the Bible says in Revelation 18, verse 8, it says her plagues, therefore her plagues will come in one day. And Pippin's question is, um, is this one day a prophetic period of time, the day-year principle? It very well might be. Um, we can't be 100% sure, but I lean toward the direction it, it is, that the plagues do not come just all of those plagues in one day, uh, because as you look at them, they're all not coming one in that same day. I see this period as a day of a prophetic day where the plagues come in a period over a year, because when you have some plagues that are already have had their effect, other plagues are falling. So yes, Pip, and I do see this is in the day year principle. Um, last question for tonight. Good morning to you all regarding the stated subject. Could you please clarify, explain the faith of Jesus and faith in Jesus? I'm really interested as it's a new truth to me and I'd like to know more. Um, in Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, um, here are they that keep the command, here's the patience of the saints, that's the endurance of the believers. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now to have the faith of Jesus, you have to have faith in Jesus. So let's look at those two terms. Faith in Jesus means I have confidence in Christ as my Savior, as my Lord. I have confidence that his grace is mine, that his forgiveness is mine, that his mercy is mine, that his power is mine. That's faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the same quality of faith that Christ had when he hung on the cross. It's, that he, it's his quality of faith given to me as a gift that's imparted to me, that lives within me, that motivates me, that inspires me, that encourages me. So faith in Jesus has to do with my trust in him to receive all spiritual blessings he, he offers. Faith of Jesus is the quality of faith that Christ had when he hung on the cross. He could not see through the portals of the tomb, we're told. He didn't see himself coming forth as conqueror, but he trusted the Father to deliver him. Well, if you have more questions, please send them in. We'll put up a web page for you to, set them, to send them in to. Here it is. Uh, our producers will put that up just now called um, info at hopelives365.com. So if you have any questions, just send them to info at hopelives365.com. Now, if you would like to sign up for all of our announcements for our programs on Hope Lives 365, we're going to be releasing some very powerful programs in the future. In fact, next week, I'm going to be taping a program uh, showing from the Bible that the emphasis to accommodate culture and to get involved in the, and the emphasis, even by some Christians, on the LBGTQ community um, is not biblical. Certainly, as Christians, we're to love all human beings. Certainly, we are to point out compassion to all human beings. But there comes a point where in the Christian faith, love does not condone sin. Love does not justify behavior that's contrary to the word of God. And the loving thing to do 
is not to pat people on the back when they're sinning on their way to perdition or destruction. It's to help them to understand that God has a better plan for their life, that in Christ and through Christ and by Christ, they can be victorious. So I'm going to release a video next week on the LGBT community, especially designed for church members and non-church members to help people see how God's power can give us deliverance over the uh, desires that we have. And we'll talk about, are people born with these desires? Are they cultivated desires? Uh, we'll talk about cultivated and inherited propensities towards sin. We'll look at exactly what the Bible teaches, and then we'll outline some steps that God can give to give victory. This is something you won't want to miss next week. You may be interested in knowing as well that each week, on Hope Lives 365, I release a commentary on the Sabbath school lessons. We're studying the book of Ephesians. We released the first one last week, but uh, we'll release another one on Ephesians, the second uh, lesson next week. So here's the webpage you can go on to if you'd like to be uh, one of our followers on Hope Lives 365. If you haven't done this yet, it is Hope Lives 365.com. You can just go on hopelives365.com and you will be able to see our videos, our releases, and particularly the ones that are coming up. I think I'll be incredibly powerful. Well, let's jump right into Revelation 21 this week. It's really one of the most encouraging chapters, I think, in, in all of the Bible. Here we go. Revelation chapter 21. Do you have your, your notepad out? Some of you are listening to these lessons more than once, and I'm so thrilled with that. Do you have your Bible, a pen to do some underlining? I know you do. You might have a, uh, a little pen that can underline in various colors. So, G so John says, now remember in Revelation 20, we saw the period of the millennium, the thousand-year period where the saints of God have been resurrected, those have died, those have been living, and with those who are dead, received immortal bodies. They've ascended to heaven with Christ. They rule on thrones with him, uh, see, seeing the fairness and goodness of God. Satan and all the evil angels are bound to earth. They see the devastation and destruction. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is raised again. He goes out to deceive the nations that have been resurrected. Why this thousand-year period? Because to secure the security of the universe, God reveals the deadly nature of sin. That if he had not stepped in, that sin would have destroyed itself and the earth would have been totally devastated. So God steps in and uh, delivers his people. Why this thousand years? To reveal the ugly nature, the horrible nature of sin as the whole universe looks upon this planet, but also to reveal God's magnificent love and the deliverance of his people. Why will sin never rise a second time? Because we understand his love and we understand the terrible nature of sin. So deeply embedded within our hearts is that choice to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to follow Jesus. At the end of that thousand years, the holy city descends with the wicked who now have been raised. And why does God raise them a second time and not just keep them in their graves for the first destruction? He does that to reveal, even if he gave them a second chance, they would in no wise um, repent. And so he shows the hardness of the heart, the, and he shows the fixedness of the choice that they've made, that the choice is actually fixed. That's what it means in Revelation, where it says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And he that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. And he that is right, righteous, let him be righteous still. So the character is fixed at the time of the coming of our Lord. Now, Revelation 21. He says, now, after all these things, the wicked rush up against that city to try to take it. Fire comes down and destroys them. The city comes down to earth. And what does John say? Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. The great hope of the scripture is that there will be this new heavens and the new earth. We find it throughout scripture. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, for example. Uh, you'll find, again, this reference for the new heavens and the new earth. Second Peter, we're looking there at chapter 3 and uh, verse uh, 13. Second Peter chapter 3. Let me read for you verse 
13, where it says that as we look for, verse 12, look for and hasten the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Christ has given us a promise, a promise that he will not break. When the journey is long, when the road is rough, when the valley is deep, when the days seem dark, cling to the promise of God, Christ will come. One day there will be a new heavens and a new earth that we can live in with Christ forever. One day sickness and suffering and sorrow and heartache will be over. One day every tear will be wiped away. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, this sinful, polluted planet. There was no more sea. What does John mean, there's no more sea? It doesn't mean there'll be no more bodies of water. There will be. John's exiled on the island of Patmos. And there as he's exiled on Patmos, he looks across the sea. He has friends, of course, in Ephesus, fellow colleagues in Ephesus. And as he looks across the sea, he sees this wide expanse of separation between him and the ones he loves, the ones he cares for, and the ones that care for him. He's on the island of Patmos alone, and he says, but one day there'll be no more sea, no more separation from those that we love. Are you separated from somebody you love? Maybe by miles, maybe by distance. Are you separated from somebody you love? Maybe by death. In the glorious coming of Christ, when the dead are resurrected, and we embrace our loved ones again, there is no more separation. This is what John is talking about here. And he says, then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. John says, I saw it. This is a reality, folk. This is not some pipe dream, not some Hollywood uh, fictitious tale. John says, I saw it. John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, when you think of a bride adorned for her husband, what are you thinking about? Something that's festive. You're thinking about a celebration. You're thinking about joy and happiness. So here now, happiness fills the universe. The holy city descends and God's people are in that city. So the city has value and worth because Jesus is there. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are there. But all the people of God are in that city as it descends. Now listen, he says, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now notice the intimacy of this language. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The tabernacle of God is with men. What does that mean? Did you notice how John introduces that? I, verse 3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, here is a solemn announcement before the whole universe that the capital of the universe is changing. Today, our world and the planets in this solar system revolve around the sun. But scientists tell us that we are one of many solar systems that all are revolving around a cosmic center from his tabernacle in heaven. Remember the earthly tabernacle in the most holy place had the Shekinah glory, the manifestation of the presence of God. God's presence was in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So God's presence in the cosmic control center of the universe rules this whole universe. But there's a loud voice saying, the tabernacle of God descends and now it is with men. God takes this planet in rebellion, this pock-marked planet, this bruised, broken planet, this war-torn planet, this famine-stricken planet. God takes this, and he creates a new heaven and a new earth, and the holy city descends on it. And this planet, so in rebellion against God, he redeems this planet, and it becomes the center of the universe, the new cosmic center of the whole universe. And from this planet, we wing our way with Jesus to worlds afar, and we follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And we give our testimony to the unfallen worlds of the grace and goodness of God. 
So the Bible says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. God himself shall be with them and be their good. God will wipe every tear away from their eyes. Now, this is after the thousand years. Does that mean there may be some tears during the thousand years after Jesus comes? It does. If we see loved ones that are not there, there may be tears that fall from our eyes. In that thousand years, we may see also times where we've disappointed Jesus and tears may fall from our eyes. But after that thousand years is over, when the new heavens and new earth come, every tear is wiped away from our eyes. There is no more memory of heartache, sorrow, disappointment, suffering, or death. No more memory of our faults or our failures. No more memory of loved ones who are not there. You see, we have the positive memories stay, but anything negative, anything that is sad, anything that brings sorrow, there is no sorrow there because there is no tear there. Only happiness and joy flow there. And the Bible says, uh, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Verse 4, there'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Those former things that cause us pain are all gone now. Then he said, on the one who sat on his throne, verse 5, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words are true and faithful. Isn't that incredibly encouraging? Right for these words are true and faithful. This is no fictitious tale. This is no Hollywood uh, story written by some script writer. This is no Star Wars make-believe drama. No, th this, is, this is true, that one day Jesus will come. One day we'll ascend to heaven with him. One day the whole universe will see the horrible nature of sin. One day the redeemed will realize in greater detail and greater depth the love of God. One day the holy city will descend. One day there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, and every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. This is not make-believe. This is reality. And the truth of the matter is, either we will live with Christ forever through all eternity, or be lost for all eternity. We will either live with Christ, or be destroyed with the brightness of his coming, and eventually destroyed in the fires of hell that um, consume the wicked, totally consumed, not burned forever, but burned up, consumed, and gone forever for all eternity. And the choice is ours. What choice will you make with Jesus? Will you give your life fully to Jesus? Will you tell him, Lord, I want to serve you, and that's the most important thing in my life? That's the appeal that Christ makes to you. We continue in our study where he says, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. It is done. Sickness and sorrow and suffering over. It is done. Chaos and calamity and confusion over. It is done. Disease, disaster, and death over. It is done. War and worry and want over. It is done. Pestilence and poverty and pollution over. It is done. Every single thing that is negative, every single thing that is destructive, every selfish thought, word, action, every sinful word, thought, it's all done. It's all over. It's finished. It is done. The plan of salvation is complete. Christ's death has provided salvation for all mankind, and Christ's life has provided victory for those who've come, and Christ's second coming has provided hope for eternity for us. Notice it says here, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. What does that mean? He's the beginning and the end. He created this world, and he will finish that which he created. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. There is an inbuilt desire for eternity in each one of us. We have been thirsting for heaven. And now that thirst is fulfilled, that longing within us for a better world. We know that this world is not our home. When we read of wars, we read of bombs that are dropping, we beat of innocent children destroyed, we know this world is not our home. When we read of, of an innocent child riding in a car and getting shot in a drive-by shooting, we know that this world is not our home. When we see the famine 
in our, this world. We see the poverty in this world and we see children on the news with distended bellies. We know this world is not our home. When we read about a man that comes home drunk and hits his wife in the face and breaks her nose and blood runs down her face and he's yelling at her and cursing and swearing, we know this world is not our home, friends. We know that there has to be something better for us than this. And there is. We thirst for eternity. And it's there for our choosing in Christ. Notice it says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. It's not love God and do as you please. It's love God and do as he pleases. There is no cheap grace in the gospel. Grace is costly. It costs the death of the Son of God. And the Bible talks about overcoming. You remember in the seven churches, he who overcomes, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. Why? Why seven overcomes? Because the Bible is telling us that wherever we find ourselves in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, that we can be overcomers through Jesus Christ. He overcomes will inherit all things. And then it talks about murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, that's spiritual, idolaters, liars. They end up in the lake of fire. And um, then it talks about in verse 9, the angel says, come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. He takes him to a high mountain, shows the holy city, New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, of course, filled with the redeemed of God. Now, there are some things about the holy city that are quite amazing. When I began to study this, it was so incredibly thrilling, I could hardly believe it. The first thing I want you to notice about the holy city is down in verse 12 of Revelation 21. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. How many gates are there? How many? 12. What does 12 symbolize in the Bible? It symbolizes the idea of, of uh, completeness, 12 gates. Now, if you look at ancient cities, they don't have 12 gates. They might have two gates, maybe two. Most would have one. Why do you think these ancient cities had only one or two gates? Because they want to keep people out. If you've got more than two gates, you've got a lot of gates. You've got to defend every gate you have. So these large walled cities that were fortresses in the ancient world would have few gates. Why does God's holy city have 12 gates? Because he doesn't want to keep people out. He wants to get people in. Now, there are three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the east, three gates on the west. When you read about three, what do you read about? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. In Revelation, you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the false trinity of the false Godhead. So three gates on the north, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have their arms wide open to those of you that live on the north. They say, come on in. To those that live in the south, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit say, come in. To those who live on the east and the west, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit say, come in. Now, what do you see? What kind of names are on those gates? It says that they have the names, verse 12, of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel represent the 12 patriarchs, everybody in the Old Testament. But when you really think about who were they, they were real rascals, those 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Um, I live in the state of Virginia. I live in the United States. If they were coming, if these 12 tribes of the children of Israel, if these patriarchs were tried in a court of law in my country, they could be tried for lying, bigamy. Uh, they could be tried for rape and incest. They could be tried for uh, thievery. Uh, they were murder. They were real rascals. Why are their names on the gates? Because they were redeemed by the grace of Christ and saved. They were men just like you and just like me. And you, they were all part of common humanity, representing all men, all women, part of common humanity. And uh, they were saved, redeemed. What about the 12 apostles? Where were their names? The Bible tells us here very clearly. It says that the 12 apostles, too, had their names on the foundations. Verse 14, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So who are these apostles? Peter, who denied him. Thomas, who doubted him. James and John, the sons of thunder. Philip, who was so reflective. Do you, do you get the point? The disciples were, tw were men and women just like you, just like me. They were men just like you, just like me. They represented all men and all women of all society. 
The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. So what we find is in the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles, the 12 patriarchs represent all peoples in the Old Testament. The 12 apostles represent all people in the New Testament. We represent, they, when we think about that holy city, we're thinking about our common humanity of sinful nature, redeemed by the grace of Christ. And what God is saying to us with these 12 gates is that you can enter in, with it, wherever you are, wherever part of this world you live in, you can enter in. The, he's saying to us with the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles with names on the gates and names on the foundations, he's saying to us that there are, that, that common humanity who've fallen and sinned have been redeemed by the grace of Christ. And if they can make it, you can make it. You can make it, my brother. You can make it, my sister. Through the grace of Christ, you can be there. But did you notice about what it says about the foundations in verse 19? Well, we better go back and look at some of the measurements of the city. Verse 16 says, the city is laid out in a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. He measured the city, the reed, 12,000 furlongs. What's that 12,000 furlongs? A furlong is about an eighth of a mile. So 12,000 furlongs is going to be about 14,000 to 15,000 miles around circumference. What does that mean for the side? It means about 375 miles on a side. This is an incredibly huge city. Huge city. Why did God make it so big? Because he's going to bring as many people into that city as he possibly can. He wants you in that city. So he's going to, that's why he's made it so large. But it's a city that is more than, than two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. It says, uh, it says he increased, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, if you have something that's length, breadth, and height are equal, what is that? It's a cube. It's actually a cube. And do you know that was the those were the dimensions of the heavenly sanctuary, like a cube? And so what this is telling us is this is the dwelling place of God. This is where God dwells, and you and I can live in the presence of God, redeemed by his grace, charmed by his love, moved by his spirit. You and I can be living in the very presence of God forever. Now, notice also what this says. It says that he measured the wall 144 cubits. What's a cubit? A cubit was the distance from the end of the elbow to the tip of the finger. You measure that. It's between 18 and 21 inches. So 144 cubits is going to be 212, 214 feet high. That's what it's going to be, just about that, 200 feet high. So this is an incredibly huge city. Why is it so big? Because God wants you there. Now notice, too, every part of this city talks about salvation. It talks about that, that God wants to save us. It talks about all the different precious stones, uh, the stones of jasper and sapphire and chalcony and emerald and sardonyx and sardius and chrysolite and beryl and topaz and chrysface and jacinth and amethyst. What, what, what are those? Why, why does he mention all those pearls? Do you know? If you look at the breastplate of the high priest, very similar stones. So what's God saying to us? He's saying, not only is this city so incredibly magnificent, but he's saying, just as I carried Israel on my heart, represented in the stones of the breastplates, the 12 tribes of Israel, Jesus, I'm carrying you in my heart. And then it says, each, every one of those 12 doors is a pearl. What's Jesus saying there? He says, I'm the pearl of great price. I carry you on my heart. I know your heartaches. I know your sorrows. I know the tears that flow that nobody else can see. I know the struggles you have with victory, but Jesus says, through the pearl of great price, you can be there. Jesus says, I'm carrying you on my heart, and I love you, and I'll give you power to overcome. Jesus is saying, there is no reason why you cannot live in that city. The door of heaven is opened for you. Those 12 gates are open for you. The pearl of great price died for you. Jesus bears you upon his heart. And notice here it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls. This is verse 21. Each individual gate was as of one pearl. 
The street of the city was like pure gold, like transparent glass. Pure gold. Why gold? Because Jesus is likened in the Bible to the golden wedge of Ophir. Everything about this city tells us about Jesus. The gates open tell us about Jesus. The size of the city tells us about the largeness of his grace, the bigness of his love, the huge heart that he has for us, the breastplate, the, the precious stones tell us about a God who carries us on his heart. The streets of the city tell us about the preciousness of faith because, you know, the Bible talks about uh, gold tried in the fire is faith. We walk down those streets of gold. We see that our faith has been tried, but we've trusted Jesus and our faith has grasped Jesus. Notice it says too, and I saw no temple in it. Verse 22, why no temple? Because of the fact that what was the major thing in the temple? The major thing in the temple was the sacrificial service, but there was no need there for the sacrificial service. Now we are in the presence of God. So there's no temple there because we have no sacrificial service left. We are redeemed by his grace and we live in his presence. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. See, that's the reason. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. Why aren't the gates shut? Because we are perfectly secure. There's no threat from any enemy army. There's no threat from a thief, murderer, adulterer, or an intruder to break into our house. We are secure. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, but there shall be by no means anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In that great city, we are secure. Secure in Christ's love, secure in his goodness, secure in his mercy. We are secure in the one that died for us, in the one that lives for us, in the one that's coming again for us. We are secure in his presence. We never have to worry again. There is no fear in our hearts of heart disease or cancer or that our child will die in a car accident. All fear is gone. All worry is gone. All anxiety is gone. There is no want there, no hunger. We are satisfied in full. Our inner spiritual life is satisfied. We don't thirst for any more because we have everything we need in Jesus. He has supplied all of our needs. This is a land worth striving for. The cheap pleasures of this world can never match the pleasures of eternity. As it says in Psalm 16 and verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Would you like to say tonight, Jesus, help me to be weaned from the things of earth. Help the things of time not strangle out my view of eternity. Would you like to say, Jesus, tonight, I long for you more than anything else. And I long for the day that the holy city will descend. And I long for the day, Jesus, that I will see you face to face and live with you forever. Would you like to say that right now as we pray? Oh, Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we can live for him forever and ever. Thank you that he's coming again for us. Thank you that one day the holy city will descend and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. Until that day, keep us faithful to you always, Father. We choose tonight to serve you with all of our heart and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, next week is our last program in the Revelation series. But we are not stopping here. We're going to continue with our Bible studies, a broader study of the Bible. I'm going to look at Countdown to Eternity. 
countdown to eternity. What events take place between us and the coming of Jesus? It'll be a deep study of the prophecies of the Bible that lead us to understand what's going to happen. What about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in latter rain power before Jesus comes? What are the prerequisites to receiving that spirit? What about, in addition to that, the shaking that the Bible says, where many Christians and Adventists will be shaken out? Who's going to be shaken out? Why are they going to be shaken out? What, how can you live through the time of trouble when you can't buy or sell? A Christ-centered biblical approach to studying the Word of God. We'll announce the date that that starts next week. Now, next week is our last Wednesday in the Revelation series, so be sure to join us. And uh, if you want to donate to this ministry, because we are totally donor-supported, that's how we stay on the air, you can go to hopelives365.com forward slash donate. That's hopelives365.com forward slash donate. And thank you, many of you who are participating and donating to our ministry. It is such an incredible blessing that keeps us preaching the gospel. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.